been cordially invited to another episode of I'll Tell You What, the podcast that's all love, Black History. I'll Tell You What is presented by Hugh I Do, and I'm Ashley, your favorite rock on tooth that tells you these love stories every single Monday. So don't forget to subscribe on the tube of you or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to also follow us everywhere you can, and if you want to sit in one of the front pews and know more about these famous lovers that I love to tell you about. And if you want to make sure your love story requests get bumped to the top of the line, you need to join us on Patreon. If you have any questions or comments, as always, know that you can head to iltellyouwhat.com and leave them there. So, all right, y'all, let's get into this week's love story. So this is actually a spin the aisle episode for all you OG aisle runners because I want to go back and re-reflect on Miss Anne Lowe. Now, Anne Lowe is not a household name. However, you have probably seen what is considered her greatest work of all time. And that was the wedding dress worn by one Jacqueline Lee Bouvier or Jackie O. But back then, Jacqueline Kennedy. But Anne Lowe was more than the designer of that bridal gown. She was a pioneering African-American fashion designer and couturier, renowned for her exceptional talent of her dresses and formal appear she made for the elite. Born in Alabama in 1898, Anne overcame racial barriers to become one of the foremost designers of her time. And yet, her persistence towards her career and her craft heavily impacted her two marriages. Now you know, I'll tell you all about it. And actually, I will do so right now. age of 14, Anne Lowe married an older man named Andrew Lee Cohen. He would later change his last name to Cohn, so if you hear of her as Annie Cohn, just know we're still talking about the same person. Anyway, despite her younger age, she dropped out of school to help her mother and grandmother with the family business. She'd come from a lineage of fashion designers, or as they were known at the time, dressmakers. They were responsible for the dresses of the wife and daughters of Emmett O'Neill, who was the 34th governor of Alabama. Around the time she married Andrew, she had actually been working full-time for about a year. Two years later, something happened that accelerated her career. Her mom died, and when that happened, she had to fulfill an order of many dresses for the O'Neill family. So naturally, Annie threw herself into her work, and she actually found out that she loved this a lot. So by the 1910s, she was balancing her work and being a wife. So by the time she was 16 years old, she had a son named Arthur. Her husband, however, hated this. He felt like many men of that time that Anne should be at home with their child while he was at work as either a tailor or a drop shop chain store owner. I don't know. There were conflicting details on his job. But anyway, regardless, he might have been one of those men that felt like having a working wife was an indictment on his ability or rather his inability to provide and take care of the household. Despite the fact that though during that time there were a lot of black wives that were working because even back then like households needed all the money that they could get and and black families by large economically were at a disadvantage. So while Anne hated the idea of quitting this job that or this career rather that she loved so much, she obliged. She was a good wife. She took her husband's complaint seriously and stopped working. She would find satisfaction in making her own clothes during that time. So when 1916 rolled around, while shopping at a department store in Dothan, Alabama, a white woman went up to her. Now, Anne was like, <laughs> caught off guard because what does this white lady want with me? And I don't know who this woman is. 
she would quickly learn exactly what, and it would change her life. The woman, Josephine Edwards Lee, asked her where does she get her outfit from because she found it to be so beautiful and told her that actually she was the one that made it. Now, Mrs. Lee told her she'd, quote, never seen a colored girl so well dressed. That was a compliment back then. Yeah, I know. She then asked her if she would be open to moving to Tampa, where she lived, to be her family's dressmaker. You see, Mrs. Lee needed gowns not only for her and herself, but her daughters, including her twin daughters, the oldest, who were both engaged and were going to have a double wedding in the near future, and they wanted to wear identical wedding gowns. Yeah. So, thrilled... And tells her husband when she gets home about this offer. And as expected, he was not excited about it and told her to turn it down. Now, I'll leave you with this quote from Anne that shares essentially what happened next. Quote, I left my husband today. I packed my belongings, grabbed my young son, and sought my freedom. My great-grandmother was enslaved. My grandmother was enslaved. It is 1916. I will not be enslaved. I know that's right, Miss Anne. Around the age of 18, Ann Lowe left her husband of about four years in Alabama and took their toddler to Tampa. She had been offered a job as the in-home designer for the wife and daughters of a prominent businessman that returned her to a career in which she desperately loved and missed. And she loved it. The family she worked for wanted to support her career as her design skills had a few limitations. So they paid for her to go to fashion design school in New York in 1917. She excelled through the two-year program in half the time and went back to Florida and continued to be the live-in in-home designer for the Lees. That was until either 1919 or 1920 when she met and married a hotel bellhop or day laborer named Caleb West. They rented a home in the black side of town and Anne created a workroom behind their house. They shared a life together in Tampa until the late 1920s. In 1928, Anne, Caleb, and Arthur, her son, moved to Harlem. The timing in which Anne moved varies from when Caleb moved, but it is recorded that they ended up living up there together. She had a design studio where she could continue to design her own pieces, but to help pay the bills, she would work for other design houses too. Too, like AF Chantilly. Now, compared to her first husband, Caleb was more supportive of her career, but that support wasn't enough for their marriage to survive. And later recalled that he said, quote, he wanted a real wife, not one who was forever jumping out of bed to sketch dresses. So by sometime between 1935 and 1940, they were separated. He moved out of their home and years later struggled to locate her so he could deliver her divorce papers. Well, he was looking for Annie Cone West, but by the time she had changed her name to Anne Lowe. But eventually he was able to sue for divorce, quote, on the grounds of desertion, and their divorce was finalized by early 19. 1942. So if you couldn't tell, Anne Lowe was always an independent woman, like in the Destiny's Child way too. She knew she was good at her job, she had a passion she loved, and the men in her life couldn't reconcile being married to a working woman, though it was way more common than sometimes we remember. Now, it didn't matter because most of her greatest works would happen after her second marriage ended. Anne Lowe's skills afforded her the opportunity to design for many high society ladies, but perhaps her most notable work is the wedding gown of Jacqueline Kennedy. It is probably of no surprise to any of us, but I just have to say this. A black woman made one of the most 
famous wedding dress of all time. Let that sink in. But the story around that gown, child, is a lot if you didn't know. So this began when Anne designed Janet, who is Jackie's mom's wedding dress to her second husband in 1942, which was actually the same year Anne's marriage to her second husband, Caleb, officially ended. She also made Mama Jackie O two Mother of the Bride dresses as well. So when the time came around for Jackie to get married, naturally Mama Jackie O thought of Anne. Quote, Mrs. Auchincloss, knowing and loving Anne's designs, as she did, had come confidence that Anne would produce the perfect design for her youngest daughter. Anne did. But first, you have to know that Jackie O was engaged twice up to that point because the first time was in 1952 and that was to a broke boy, sort of. Well, I mean, he was a Wall Street broker named John Husted, 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 mm. Anyway, Jackie had gone through a bridal consultation with Anne, but not too long after that, the wedding was called off because she said he was, quote, immature and boring. So about two months later, in May of 1952, she met John F. Kennedy, who was running for a Senate seat. The following summer, in June 1953, he proposed to her at a restaurant called Martin's Tavern in Georgetown. So when the time came around again, Jackie wanted a, quote, sleek, elegant gown. Her mom and future in-laws were opposed to that. You see, Janet, quote, wanted her daughter's wedding dress to be an elegant fairy tale ball gown. So it was. Anne was commissioned to design the wedding gown of not just Jackie, but also the bridal party gowns as well. So this would be a total of 15 gowns. She signed an NDA or something like that to Val to not speak of designing the gowns for this wedding. As you know, the Kennedy family was a really big deal in the political world and we don't do things for clout around here, right? So Anne and her team worked long and hard for two months on these dresses after the sketches were approved. The author of Anne Lowe's biography, Something to Prove, described the bridal gown as, quote, the short sleeve wedding dress was made of 50 yards of ivory silk taffeta. Interwoven bands of tucking formed the figure-hugging bodice, which featured a portrait neckline. It was on the long bouffant skirt that the intricacy of the design stood out. The interwoven bands of tucking were similar to the tucking on the bodice, but here they form large circular designs which floated around the skirts. Below these eye-catching circles, the interwoven bands of tucking form ten waves that encircled the dress and danced as the bride moved. Tiny wax flowers were tucked discreetly about the skirt. The gown took two months to sew and put together, like I told y'all. And I keep having to say this because of what happened. So 10 days before the wedding, its studio flooded. The wedding dress was ruined. Like nine of the bridesmaids dresses were ruined. And like, if you're an OG all runner and you've seen enough of my videos you know you know you know what I'm about to say and it is that something is always going to go wrong around your wedding day you can't do anything about it I swear I swear I swear I swear but in this case Jackie had no idea Jackie nor her family were aware of this disaster and baby it was a true disaster for Miss Anne because you see she charged the Auchin Claus Bouvier family $500 for Jackie's dress which which would have been around like a $5,800 wedding dress today. And some speculated that she should have charged at least $1,500, which today would have been like over $17,000. So including the cost of the bridesmaids dresses, Anne was expecting to make about $700, which today would have been a little more than $8,000. But instead... <laughs> She had to purchase more fabric, expand her team, and by working non-stop around the clock, they got all the dresses done. But Anne ended up losing $2,000, which if that would have been today, would have been around $23,000. I know. And through all of that, did you know that that lady, that lady, that lady was very very rude about her gown. She said she looked like a lampshade and of all the wedding vendors that worked the wedding, Anne was the only one to not receive proper credit. She did. She did. My bad. 
she received credit after JFK was assassinated, which was like a decade later. You know what? No, no, actually, let me be correct. In 1961, Ladies Home Journal called her a quote, a colored woman dressmaker, not the haute couture. I'm sorry. That hurt Anne's feelings as I would imagine, as you would imagine, as it would hurt all of our feelings if this were us. Like, be for real. And Lo was that girl, is that girl, and will forever be that girl. Jackie tried to right the wrongs done to Anne later on by anonymously paying off her back taxes, which were over $12,000. And this is assumed. We don't really know that, but we know that at one point Anne had like over $10,000 that was due to suppliers, but they were just like, whatever, you've like given us thousands of dollars of work through the years. So like, girl, whatever, it's fine. But she did have like over $12,000 worth of like back taxes and due to the IRS and then mysteriously they went away so you know but essentially that experience in a nutshell really encompassed in Lowe's career because she exclusively worked with mostly white esteemed wealthy individuals not social climbers not clout chasers no though she sold her work by hand she was notorious for undercharging her dresses partially because she wasn't really aware of the cost of materials and resources needed before providing quotes and even then her clients would still request discounts because they felt like she was a black woman and they could get away with it and they would. Ebony Magazine journalist Jerry Major wrote about Miss Lowe in 1966, quote, she is more interested in the creation of clothes who will wear them and where they will be seen than in what they cost and what her profit will be. So though at one point in her career, she quote, grossed $300,000 annually, she essentially died broke. After losing her sight in 1981, Miss Anne Lowe died after a long battle with an undisclosed illness. Despite her hardships, this is the life she chose. This is the life she desired. Anne decided to choose her career and the happiness she received from her career over being constrained in a marriage where she would be nothing more than just someone's wife. And that, Isle Runners, concludes the life and love story of Miss Anne Low. So what did you think about Anne Lowe's love story? If you want to learn more about her and come through the same books and research that I came across, definitely head to I'll tell you what.com. And you know the drill by now. Come back, come back next week for yet another Black History love story, friends. See you in the peas. Mm-hmm.